Welcome to Conference Championship Weekend. There are eight conference championships up for grabs today. We are going to get action from all eight of these conference championships, but we know the big four conferences are the ones that are gonna have the most spotlight. These are the eight teams that are still alive for winning one of the big four conference championships and thus earning an automatic berth to the college football playoff. So remember how this works is that each of the big four conference championships, the better team or the better record team is going to be hosting the game and that the winner will go to the college football playoff automatically. So in our matchups of Georgia and USC, UNC, Washington and Colorado, Penn State and Ohio State, Kansas State and TCU, those winners will end up getting those automatic bursts, the college football playoff. They'll be ranked from there and we will see what the matchups are at the end of the episode. I am incredibly excited to see how this plays out. Uh, we're going to get action from all of these games, so let's first get started with Ohio and Toledo. For this MAC championship game, they are the only conference that is going to be playing on a neutral field. The reason being, I feel like the MAC championship is so synonymous for field. So let's get started with today's game with Ohio and Toledo. First up is Ohio on offense. We're checking in at the end of the first quarter. Ohio and Curtis Worker are already up 7-0 after a pretty good season that Work has had. They aren't able to connect. They had a field goal and a touchdown later on and take a 17-0 lead. And then are up 17-3 at point through the second quarter. It's a big third down. Option look to their running back. He gets into the end zone. They go up 24-3 and you can see he's had a really great season this season, especially in the MAC and they take a pretty commanding lead that Toledo is able to work their way back to now. Only down 24-20, seven minutes to go for Daquan Finn. He finds his man, puts him out in the flat. That would eventually lead to a Toledo touchdown and give them their lead as they would hold a 34-31 lead with about a minute to go. Daquan Finn, as you can see, has had a great season through the air and rushing the football. It's a third and nine, a conversion here, and locks up the MAC championship for Toledo. He throws to an old reliable receiver, Hits him in stride, Jerwan Newton, 31 yards, gets the first down. He's had an amazing year, and this Toledo team, only one loss on the entire season. They deserve it. They were the team of destiny in the MAC the entire season. Some nice pleasantries after the game between Toledo and Ohio. A rivalry that got to be on this big stage, well deserved. And it should come as a shock to no one that the do-it-all quarterback, Daquan Finn, ended up taking home player of the game in MAC championship MVP honors as the Toledo Golden Rockets are your MAC champions for the season. And I think they're gonna be a little bit of a surprise team going into next season. Their top receiver and Daquan Finn are coming back next year, so keep an eye on them. Kansas State and TCU is our next conference championship on the docket. These are two of the purple renegades going to face off in today's game. And they both have pretty explosive offenses and always know how to move the football. But the offense that I really want to highlight is the passing game. 380 yards per game for TCU. How do they do it? Well, the big part of that for them is their triple threat attack at receiver. Jack Beck, JoJo Earl, and Savion Williams have all gone over 1,000 yards and caught at least seven touchdowns. They are a lethal trio that is going to give Kansas State problems today if they cannot come up with a solution for how to contain them. We're going to check in in the second quarter. Kansas State is already down 20-3. to Will Howard is trying to make something happen. He finds his receiver and is able to cut into the lead 20-10. to Would they be able to keep TCU in check, though? Well, TCU's already back up 27-10, to and Chandler Morris has put up a phenomenal season. Almost Heisman-worthy, you would say. He has second and goal. He hits Jack Beck over the middle for six yards out. And TCU is in total control of this one so far against Kansas State. And the important thing for Jack Beck is that touchdown gave him the school record for receiving touchdowns in the season with 15, beating Josh Doxson's old record. And do you remember Josh Doxson? He was pretty dang good for TCU, so that's a worthy record and very impressive. Kansas State, though, as we've seen the entire season, scrapping away, eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter, still only a two possession game down 16. It's a fourth and one. They're able to get the conversion, and Kansas State is still alive against TCU, trying to keep the heartbeat going. They go backwards, though, and this is their fourth and goal. They need it here. They need something to try and cut into this lead, make it a one-score game. Howard drops back, and he just throws in the flat. That's not going to work for them. Treshawn Ward cannot get into the end zone there. They turn it over on downs, and TCU has taken 
the stranglehold on this one, but for good measure, when you have an offense like this, you might as well drive the ball back down the field, see what you can do. It's third and goal, get the outside block for Amani Bailey, two yard uh, out score, and TCU goes up by three scores, and that will seal the deal. Chandler Morris, after getting hurt the season before and not getting to be really be a part of TCU's magical run to the playoff, is a part of TCU booking their ticket to a second straight playoff appearance. And Chandler Morris and his triple threat at receivers are going to be a lot to handle for anybody in this college football playoff era. I can't wait to see who they face. Chandler Morris gets MVP honors of the Big 12 championship game. But I do want to point out the game that Jack Beck had. 14 catches for 199 yards. Not too shabby there. And those triple threat receivers, as you can see, all had over 100, 100 yards. Not too shabby at all. Sonny Dykes gets his first Big 12 championship with TCU in that second straight playoff berth. So not too shabby at all, but this will end Kansas State's hopes of making it to the college football playoff. We now see them lowly in a black and white logo, but these are now our seven teams alive for the four spots in the college football playoff. Next up on our docket is another, we'll say lesser conference game between Coastal Carolina and Georgia Southern. When you look at the stats for these two teams, they've had pretty similar seasons, both 8-4 overall, and there's not really a carrying quality for either of these teams on the offense or defensive side, but you are looking at top 42 offenses, so they're going to try and put some points on the board, and hopefully we get a good game in this Sun Belt Championship game that is going to be played at Coastal Carolina. First up, we're going to Grayson McCall in the Coastal Carolina shot to clears in the second quarter, down by three. It's a third and six, looking great on that teal field getting the drop back from a call. He's able to find his tight end, a beautiful look to Kendall Carr, 18 yards out and a score, 17 to 13 Coastal Carolina early as they take this lead over Georgia Southern. He, and this is a big one for Grayson Call because he breaks the score record for passing touchdowns, seeing a lot of record-breaking performances in today's gaming conference championship weekend, and you know, that's what it's all about. Next up, we're going to get our first look at Georgia Southern and Davis Brings. Had a really nice senior campaign. Doesn't turn the ball over a ton. It's a second and goal. They're down by seven. They need to make a play if they want to tie this up in the third quarter. Brings looking, looking, looks out to his left. And oh, there's the announcer curse. There is the pick six for a quarterback that has not had a lot of turnovers. He is gone down the sidelines. Coastal Carolina is going to have a huge shift here. They will go up by two scores and a 14-point lead for the Chanticleers. But Georgia Southern would not go away. They would answer and force Coastal Carolina to get the ball back. And they're only up by seven. But this read option look for McCall, he's able to spring free and he is untouched. Georgia Southern is now chasing him down the sidelines. They aren't going to get to him. Grayson McCall all the way to the house. 75 yards of offense straight into your veins from Grayson McCall. Georgia Southern, their last chance. They're able to fight back to a seven point deficit. Minute 30 to go, third and goal. What do they have in their system? They're going to try and run it up in the middle. They cannot get in the end zone to tie this one up. It forces a fourth and goal for Davis Brin and company. They're going to the shotgun look, what they do best, putting it in their quarterback's hands. You know, he's made some great decisions usually. He's looking, he gets hit as he throws. This is what hits the ground. And that's going to seal the deal for Coastal Carolina. And in these new look conferences, the shot to clears of Myrtle Beach go in and get their first Sun Belt championship in this new alignment and then conclude a 9-4 season, which not too shabby for them. And it feels really great for a quarterback that has been around college football so long, like Grayson Hall. He is your Sun Belt championship game MVP after a performance like that. And Tim Deck, their coach, in his first season at Coastal Carolina, gets them to a Sun Belt championship. So not too bad of a season at all, and nothing to hang your heads about with Georgia Southern. Clearly two teams that were very close. Now, another major conference matchup. It's North Carolina and Georgia. Earlier in the season, Georgia has already throttled North Carolina. North Carolina is looking for some revenge, but they are playing the team that might be the hottest in college football. They have won 10 straight games after starting the season 0-2. And unlike a lot of Georgia teams, it is their offense that has a lot of the great metrics that make them very dangerous, while also sporting the number one rush defense in the country. Can Drake May and company lead North Carolina to a spot in the college football playoff with an upset of Georgia? 
Well, first we're going to find out in the third quarter, about a minute and 30 to go. Georgia's only up by six. It's a first and goal. They're going to hand the ball off to Daywan Edwards. He gets in from less than a yard out, and that gives Georgia a 20-7 to lead. North Carolina is going to need to find some offense as they have been struggling through. Three quarters, only seven points, but this one got eight and a half to go in the fourth quarter. Drake May and company have a third down. May is trying the read option, and Georgia is able to close on him with that vaunted rush defense. They stop him in his tracks. That's Javon Bullard. They were able to get a conversion on fourth down. Drake May and company are now facing a third and 14. When you're down by 13, it feels like you really need a score to get back into this one. Time's running out on you. And Georgia's able to knock that one away and force a fourth and 14. Big drive for Carolina. You gotta get something here. You're really approaching danger zone. Here's Drake May looking, trying to fire to a similar spot. Nylon Green knocks it down. That would allow Georgia to hold on for the score. Kirby Smart and Mac Brown share their pleasantries in a very hard-fought game between the two. But Carson Beck is somebody that I want to point out of just being a very impressive uh, quarterback at this point. Has really improved and earns his SEC championship game honors. Georgia books their ticket, and their hopes for a third straight national title are still alive, and Drake May and company are going to have to leave the field knowing that they left a lot on the table. They played a pretty good game. They outgained Georgia on the ground and through the air. They had the one turnover that was pretty costly. They had more first downs, time of possession similar. It was just kind of a weird game and how it turned out. And Georgia was able to finish off drives and when they needed it. So it's a tough look for Carolina and Drake May. It's uh, going to be a rough offseason kind of with the transition. As you imagine, Drake May is going to leave for Carolina as they're going to go through a lot of changes. But still a vaunted effort to give Georgia a really nice game after they really got handled earlier in the season. So good season for North Carolina, but they ran into a juggernaut like Georgia. And I feel like there's no shame in that. Then when we look at our updated college football playoff picture, North Carolina is off the map, and we now have six teams for four spots. We still have the Washington and Colorado game and Penn State and Ohio State game left on the docket. But let's head to another matchup first. Let's go to Philadelphia and Lincoln Financial Field to see the UTSA Roadrunners take on the Temple Owls in a game that's going to feature a pretty interesting matchup of some quarterbacks that have been lighting up the lower conferences. So we have a 7-5 UTSA versus an 8-4 Temple. Again, not a lot of qualities that come out on the offensive end. They both look pretty okay. But Temple's defense has been pretty dang good, allowing less than 20 points a game. And we'll see if they can contain Frank Harris and the Roadrunners. Those Roadrunners are in the second quarter, down 10-7. But it's a first and goal for Frank Harris, getting great protection and making a really nice crossbody throw to the pylon to Chris Carpenter to give them a lead. At this point, UTSA would hold a 10-point, 23-13 lead going into the fourth quarter, and it's EJ Warner getting some nice protection on third down, trying to make as good of a throw as he can, but he gets picked off, and that would give the Roadrunners the ball back and put Temple in a rough spot. But they would get a turnover. They would get the ball back on their own. It's first and goal, only down by 10. Warner finds his man. He's able to get in the end zone. He adds a passing touchdown to his conference championship resume. And now Temple is only down by three. Tem- uh, UTSA gets the ball back, 345 to go. If they get a third down conversion here, it would really help with burning the clock. Frank Harris looking and it's a drop on the sidelines and UTSA would be forced to kick a field goal to go up 26-20. Now Temple just needs a touchdown and an extra point to win this game. It's fourth down though from the 25 yard line, fourth and 12. He's going to get some pressure on him. He throws to the sidelines. It's knocked away, and that will seal the deal, and that will give the conference championship to the UTSA Roadrunners. Good effort from Temple, but losing on your home field in a conference championship game has got to be rough, but give all the credit in the world. The execution was really top-notch from UTSA. There was nothing flashy really going on, but when they needed it, they rode their quarterback, Frank the Tank Harris, as he takes home the conference championship MVP honors. Great work by them and the Roadrunners. They've established themselves as one of those programs in the lower rungs that is going to give you a game no matter what, and I would expect to see that program to continue to ascend if they can get some good recruiting in there. Next up, we have a former power conference in the ACC championship game with Syracuse and Wake Forest. Two 9-3 teams that did quite well in the ACC, and 
Um, they've got some pretty interesting metrics if you look at them. Like Syracuse is a top 25 offense. They run the ball or they run the ball okay, but they pass the ball really well. They get a lot of yards, and that they're 22nd in uh, their offense overall in terms of getting points. So, gotta say Syracuse is uh, a threat to be reckoned with. So let's see them on offense. They're down by nine points in the second quarter. On a third and 10, Garrett Schrader dumps this one off and it would lead to a Syracuse field goal as they would go down 16 to 10, but eventually knock on a touchdown as they're up one point in the third quarter. It's a third and goal for Wake Forest. They're gonna try and punch in a touchdown. That's obviously a little more useful than a field goal. Read option, triple option look to Taylor Morin. He gets into the end zone and Wake Forest is able to take a lead on that touchdown and eventually tack on a field goal to go up 25-17. Wake Forest with the ball again near the end of the third quarter. It's third and nine. You're already up by eight. Going to throw to the back of the end zone. That's Jamal Banks. That touchdown puts them up two scores. And Wake Forest feeling really good after that score, as that would be the finishing touches that they would need on an ACC championship. Congratulations to the Demon Deacons, as they are ACC conference championships, conference champions. And they could be looking at a New Year's Six game uh, bid with that performance, with how well they played. Great work, and it's Jamal Banks taking home the ACC Championship MVP. Good work on his part, as Wake Forest is a team that certainly took the challenge of kind of getting put into a lesser conference and kind of handled the teams they were supposed to and did a really good job. And I think they're a candidate to possibly get themselves to a higher conference a little bit in the future. Now, we have two games left. And they're biggies. We have Colorado at Washington. Washington is a team that has been an offensive juggernaut the entire season. Those metrics are insane. All four of our main metrics, they are top 10 in the country. Colorado does not really have a carrying tree on there. They're in the 30s for passing yards, rushing yards, and yards overall. But defensively as well, they don't really have anything that stands out other than a pretty good rush defense. Let's see if they are able to contain this Washington offense. And as you can see, Washington is in the middle of the third quarter, down 24 to seven. They need something to happen. And Michael Penix has to take it himself. They cut into this lead 24 to 14. Now, Washington again, they're able to get the ball back after a three and out. It's 24, 14, third and 12. Big throw by Penix to Rome Adunzie, who has had a phenomenal season this year and has been Michael Penix's big target on pretty much all of the crucial downs that would eventually lead to a touchdown. Colorado will only up 24-21, but they get the ball back. They drive down the field about eight minutes to go. It's a third and six. Fires down the field to his tight end, Eric Olson. Shador Sanders with pinpoint accuracy. Sets up Colorado for a possible touchdown drive if they can punch this in. And with less than eight minutes to go, that would be pretty dang crucial. Third and goal for Colorado. Here's Kavisky Smoke running his way into the end zone, and that gives Colorado a two-score lead again, 31-21, about six minutes to go. Washington gets the ball, drives down the field, fourth and goal. They don't get it here, it's probably over, but Daniel Nada keeps the Husky heartbeat alive, cuts this lead to three, four minutes left. Washington gets a turnover on the ensuing drive. They get back in territory very quickly, they're back in scoring range. Penix on the read option. Washington has the lead back, 35-31. Colorado will have one more chance. It's a third and 22. It's not looking great. Minute 47 to go. Is there any magic left for Shador Sanders? This one's going to come up short. And then a botched fourth down would end up ending this game. And the Washington Huskies are your Pac-12 champions. There are some congratulations in order for Deion Sanders to rally this team and turn them into a contender in the Pac-12 in year one. Good work on his part, but let's give the Huskies their flowers and Michael Penix Jr., who might have sealed up his Heisman candidacy with today's game. He is obviously our MVP and takes home those Pac-12 championship MVP honors. Kalen DeBoer, clearly happy, and you gotta imagine Deion Sanders and company are gonna come out next time and next season a little bit more fiery and have got a lot to prove in season two under Dion. Now, our last game, we got five teams still in the hunt, but one game to go with Penn State and Ohio State. These two traditional Big Ten rivals. I'm sure it's gonna be a great game, but only one of them can book their ticket to the college football playoff. Ohio State is also playing for a perfect season. They are currently 12-0. A win today would lock up a 13-0 regular season for this team. 
a lot to play for at this night game in Columbus for the Big Ten Championship game. What more could you want as we close out our conference championship weekend? Now, when we go and look at the breakdown of the stats, Ohio State is so impressive in a lot of areas. And the one area that you can see that they are not as, as impressive is in the passing game on offense. They are a team that has run the ball so consistently and so effectively that they really haven't had to throw for a lot of yards under Kyle McCord, who's been so pre- precise in the offense. But you, when you look at this duo that they have on and at running back, you can see why. Mayan Williams and Travion Henderson both rushing for over 1,000 yards and 13 touchdowns and nine touchdowns between them. What more could you want? So first thing we're gonna look at when we go to the Big Ten Championship game, it's in the second quarter. It's a third and six for Kyle McCord. He throws a great route to Lorenzo Styles, who gets some separation to the outside, a 26 yard score, and there's some passing game for them. But next time around, Travion Henderson gets in the end zone as well and gets Ohio State their lead back 14 to 10 in the third quarter. Drew Aller and company now have the football. It's third and 12, under six minutes to go in the third quarter. They're looking for a conversion to try and keep pace with Ohio State, but that pass rush from Ohio State started to get home a little more often, and that would derail that Penn State drive and give the ball back to Ohio State. Ohio State would end up having to punt on their next drive and give the ball back to Penn State, who's down 21 to 10 at this point. Little bit of time left in the third quarter. It's a first and goal handoff from Penn State. That's Tank Smith. Very appropriate name, getting himself into the end zone. It's 21 to 17. Penn State has cut that lead, but Ohio State quickly gets back down the field. It's third and goal, seven minutes to go in the fourth quarter. You might as well find the best receiver in the country, Marvin Harrison Jr. Jumping catch gives Ohio State that two score lead. Another quick possession for Penn State. They give the ball back to Ohio State, and if you're gonna give them all those opportunities, it's third and nine. Might as well hit Lorenzo Styles for his third touchdown of the game. Pretty phenomenal performance. And Ohio State seals up their Big Ten championship in perfect season. James Franklin and company just did not have the answers. They were not able to handle that pass rush, and Drew Aller just looked very human in today's game, but that's pretty expected for a true for her for a redshirt freshman. And Lorenzo Styles takes home Big Ten Championship MVP honors, deservedly so after a game like that. And Ohio State gets what they wanted. They didn't just want that perfect season. They needed that Big Ten Championship to assure themselves of their spot in the college football playoff. And now, we have the big question. How are these teams going to get ranked? Well, let's see what I came up with and I can explain some logic to everybody. So our number one seed is Ohio State. They are 13-0, they are the perfect season, they've looked great as well, they are our number one seed undoubtedly. Then when it came down to deciding the number two seed, Georgia really wasn't in consideration. They had their two early losses, and sure they've won 11 in a row now, but they lost to a 4-8 Clemson and a 4-8 South Carolina team. Um, that was not going to be number two team potential. And then Washington's one loss was a three-point loss at a rivalry game. LSU's other loss was to LSU, which is a good loss. Florida State lost to them, so we can't really say much, but Washington didn't really play their starters a lot. It was the final game. They had clinched everything for the Pac-12 championship. They still lost, so they can't obviously be the number one team when you still have an undefeated team like Ohio State, but I will give Washington the edge, and they will be the number two team with their dynamic offense and possible Heisman Trophy quarterback. And then when it came down to three and four, LSU lost to an LSU team that was very good in the SEC. Georgia lost to two teams in the SEC that were not good at all, really, in Clemson and South Carolina. So that kind of comparison makes it difficult, and I would hate to just give Georgia and Ohio State that matchup again, because I think Georgia's really good. But TCU might be even hotter than Georgia because TCU lost in week one, and they've won 12 straight. So that argument of just how hot Georgia is kind of gets negated a little bit. So... When push came to shove, this is what I came up with. We have Ohio State and Georgia, their rematch of the semifinal last year. So two teams that made the playoff, obviously. TCU made the playoff last year, and our only newcomer this year is Washington. They've previously made it quite a while ago, but they get to come back to the playoff. So the purple teams matching up in that game, there is going to be a ton of points. Cannot wait to watch that one. So that will be on the docket after we see who Florida State plays in their bowl game. We'll get the bowl game, and then... I will give you both. I will give you the, both of the semifinal actions and then the or the national championship game, obviously. 
But next, let's find out who our Heisman Trophy winner is. Surprise, surprise, it is Michael Penix Jr. from Washington and actually a pretty close race with Chandler Morris, Braylon Allen, Caleb Williams, and Kyle McCord. All worthy winners, but Michael Penix, those numbers, clearly deserving of a national or of a Heisman Trophy. And then we, as Florida State, our next game and the next game on the channel is going to be Florida State against Texas in the Sugar Bowl. Um, I think that's a pretty good matchup. Uh, Texas has only lost one game this season. They lost to TCU. We lost to LSU and to Georgia. Pretty good losses. Two name brands playing each other in the Sugar Bowl. I uh, don't think that's going to be a bad matchup at all. I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how that one plays out. We'll play a pretty dynamic offense in Texas. So that'll be the next game on the channel. I really appreciate everybody uh, watching this long one. I know it's a lot of games, but wanted to give you as much coverage as possible. And uh, go Nulls!